The Minstrel Show. None of the foregoing should be interpreted as an excuse for the violence, decadence, or misogyny that pervades what has come to be known as gangster culture. The images and messages are extremely damaging. On an average night, one need engage in only a few minutes of channel surfing during primetime hours to stumble across images of gangster culture on television. The images are so familiar, no description is necessary here. Often these images emanate from BET, or black-themed reality shows, and are thus considered authentic expressions of black attitudes, culture, and mores. Again, though, it is useful to put the commodification of gangster culture into proper perspective. The worst of gangster rap and other forms of black exploitation, such as VH1's Flavor of Love, is best understood as a modern-day minstrel show, only this time televised around the clock for a worldwide audience. It is a for-profit display of the worst racial stereotypes and images associated with the era of mass incarceration, an era in which black people are criminalized and portrayed as out of control, shameless, violent, oversexed, and generally undeserving. Like the minstrel shows of the slavery and Jim Crow eras, today's displays are generally designed for white audiences. The majority of consumers of gangster rap are white suburban teenagers. VH1 had its best ratings ever for the first season of Flavor of Love, ratings driven by large white audiences. MTV has expanded its offerings of black-themed reality shows in the hopes of attracting the same crowd. The profits to be made from racial stigma are considerable, and the fact that blacks, as well as whites, treat racial oppression as a commodity for consumption is not surprising. It is a familiar form of black complicity with racialized systems of control. Many people are unaware that, although minstrel shows were plainly designed to pander to white racism and to make whites feel comfortable with, indeed entertained by, racial oppression. African Americans formed a large part of the black minstrel's audience. In fact, their numbers were so great in some areas that theater owners had to relax rules segregating black patrons and restricting them to certain areas of the theater. Historians have long debated why blacks would attend minstrel shows when the images and content were so blatantly racist. Minstrels projected a greatly romanticized and exaggerated image of black life on plantations with cheerful, simple, grinning slaves, always ready to sing, dance, and please their masters. Some have suggested that perhaps blacks felt in on the joke, laughing at the over-the-top characters from a sense of in-group recognition. It has also been argued that perhaps they felt some connection to elements of African culture that had been suppressed and condemned for so long, but were suddenly visible on stage, albeit in racist, exaggerated form. Undeniably, though, one major draw for black audiences was simply seeing fellow African Americans on stage. Black minstrels were largely viewed as celebrities, earning more money and achieving more fame than African Americans ever had before. Black minstrelsy was the first large-scale opportunity for African Americans to enter show business. To some degree, then, black minstrelsy, as degrading as it was, represented success. It seems likely that historians will one day look back on the images of black men in gangster rap videos with a similar curiosity. Why would these young men, who are targets of a brutal drug war declared against them, put on a show, a spectacle, that romanticizes and glorifies their criminalization? Why would these young men openly endorse and perpetuate the very stereotypes that are invoked to justify their second-class status, their exclusion from mainstream society? The answers, historians may find, are not that different from the answers to the minstrelsy puzzle. It is important to keep in mind, though, that many hip-hop artists today do not embrace and perpetuate the worst racial stereotypes associated with mass incarceration. 
Artists like Common, for example, articulate a sharp critique of American politics and culture and reject the misogyny and violence preached by gangster rappers. And while rap is often associated with gangster life in the mainstream press, the origins of rap and hip-hop culture are not rooted in outlaw ideology. When rap was born, the early rap stars were not rapping about gangster life, but My Adidas and Good Times in the Hood in tunes like Rapper's Delight. Rap music changed after the war on drugs shifted into high gear, and thousands of young black men were suddenly swept off the streets and into prisons. Violence in urban communities flared in those communities, not simply because of the new drug, crack, but because of the massive crackdown which radically reshaped the traditional life course for young black men. As a tidal wave of punitiveness, stigma, and despair washed over poor communities of color, those who were demonized, not only in the mainstream press, but often in their own communities, did what all stigmatized groups do. They struggled to preserve a positive identity by embracing their stigma. Against a rap, while it may amount to little more than a minstrel show when it appears on MTV today, has its roots in the struggle for a positive identity among outcasts. The Antidote It is difficult to look at pictures of black people performing in minstrel shows during the Jim Crow era. It is almost beyond belief that at one time, black people actually covered their faces with pitch black paint, covered their mouths with white paint drawn in an exaggerated clownish smile and pranced on stage for the entertainment and delight of white audiences who were tickled by the sight of a black man happily portraying the worst racial stereotypes that justified slavery and later Jim Crow. The images are so painful they can cause a downright visceral reaction the damage done by the minstrel's complicity in the Jim Crow regime was considerable. Even so, do we hate the minstrel? Do we despise him? Or do we understand him as an unfortunate expression of the times? Most people of any race would probably condemn the minstrel show, but stop short of condemning the minstrel as a man. Pity, more than contempt, seems the likely response. Why? With the benefit of hindsight, we can see the minstrel in his social context. By shucking and jiving for white audiences, he was mirroring to white audiences the shame and contempt projected onto him. He might have made a decent living that way, may even have been treated as a celebrity. But from a distance, we can see the emptiness, the pain. When the system of mass incarceration collapses, and if history is any guide, it will. Historians will undoubtedly look back and marvel that such an extraordinarily comprehensive system of racialized social control existed in the United States. How fascinating, they will likely say, that a drug war was waged almost exclusively against poor people of color, people already trapped in ghettos that lack jobs and decent schools. They were rounded up by the millions, packed away in prisons, and when released, they were stigmatized for life, denied the right to vote, and ushered into a world of discrimination. Legally barred from employment, housing, and welfare benefits, and saddled with thousands of dollars of debt, these people were shamed and condemned for failing to hold together their families. They were chastised for succumbing to depression and anger, and blamed for landing back in prison. Historians will likely wonder how we could describe the new caste system as a system of crime control, when it is difficult to imagine a system better designed to create rather than prevent crime. None of this is to suggest that those who break the law bear no responsibility for their conduct or exist merely as products of their environment. To deny the individual agency of those caught up in the system their capacity to overcome seemingly impossible odds would be to deny an essential element of their humanity. We, as human beings, are not simply organisms or animals responding to stimuli. 
we have a higher self, a capacity for transcendence. Yet our ability to exercise free will and transcend the most extraordinary obstacles does not make the conditions of our life irrelevant. Most of us struggle and often fail to meet the biggest challenges of our lives, even the smaller challenges, breaking a bad habit or sticking to a diet, often prove too difficult, even for those of us who are relatively privileged and comfortable in our daily lives. In fact, what is most remarkable about the hundreds of thousands of people who return from prison to their communities each year is not how many fail, but how many somehow manage to survive and stay out of prison against all the odds. Considering the design of this new system of control, it is astonishing that so many people labeled criminals still manage to care for and feed their children, hold together marriages, obtain employment, and start businesses. Perhaps most heroic are those who, upon release, launch social justice organizations that challenge the discrimination ex-offenders face and provide desperately needed support for those newly released from prison. These heroes go largely unnoticed by politicians who prefer to blame those who fail rather than praise with admiration and awe all those who somehow manage, despite seemingly insurmountable hurdles, to survive. As a society, our decision to heap shame and contempt upon those who struggle and fail in a system designed to keep them locked up and locked out says far more about ourselves than it does about them. There is another path. Rather than shaming and condemning an already deeply stigmatized group, we, collectively, can embrace them, not necessarily their behavior, but them, their humanness. As the saying goes, you gotta hate the crime, but love the criminal. This is not a mere platitude, it is a prescription for liberation. If we had actually learned to show love, care, compassion, and concern across racial lines during the civil rights movement, rather than go colorblind, mass incarceration would not exist today. Chapter 5. The New Jim Crow it was no ordinary Sunday morning when presidential candidate Barack Obama stepped to the podium at the Apostolic Church of God in Chicago. It was Father's Day. Hundreds of enthusiastic congregants packed the pews at the overwhelmingly black church, eager to hear what the first black Democratic nominee for president of the United States had to say. The message was a familiar one. Black men should be better fathers, too many are absent from their homes. For those in the audience, Obama's speech was an old tune sung by an exciting new performer. His message of personal responsibility, particularly as it relates to fatherhood, was anything but new. It had been delivered countless times by black ministers in churches across America. The message had also been delivered on a national stage by celebrities such as Bill Cosby and Sidney Poitier, and the message had been delivered with great passion by Louis Farrakhan, who more than a decade earlier summoned one million black men to Washington, D.C. for a day of atonement and recommitment to their families and communities. The mainstream media, however, treated the event as big news, and many pundits seemed surprised that the black congregants actually applauded the message. For them, it was remarkable that black people nodded in approval when Obama said, if we are honest with ourselves, we'll admit that too many fathers are missing, missing from too many lives and too many homes. Too many fathers are MIA. Too many fathers are AWOL. They have abandoned their responsibilities. They're acting like boys instead of men. And the foundations of our families are weaker because of it. You and I know this is true everywhere. But nowhere is this more true than in the African-American community. The media did not ask, and Obama did not tell, where the missing fathers might be found. The following day, social critic and sociologist Michael Eric Dyson published a critique of Obama's speech in Time magazine. 
He pointed out that the stereotype of black men being poor fathers may well be false. Research by Boston College social psychologist Rebecca Levine Coley found that black fathers not living at home are more likely to keep in contact with their children than fathers of any other ethnic or racial group. Dyson chided Obama for evoking a black stereotype for political gain, pointing out that Obama's words may have been spoken to black folk, but they were aimed at those whites still on the fence about whom to send to the White House. Dyson's critique was a fair one, but like other media commentators, he remained silent about where all the absent black fathers could be found. He identified numerous social problems plaguing black families, such as high levels of unemployment, discriminatory mortgage practices, and the gutting of early childhood learning programs. Not a word was said about prisons. <laughs>